Welcome to another episode of Nutripreneur, where we uncover the future of the nutraceutical industry through the lens of innovation and expertise. I'm your host, Bethany, and today we're honored to have Vic Cherikoff, Managing Director of Australian Functional Ingredients Proprietary Limited with us. Vic stands at the forefront of integrating ancient Australian wild foods with modern health, culinary, and manufacturing practices, making a significant impact on nutrition, lifestyle medicine, and longevity research. So let's go ahead and dive into the world of wild foods and explore how they're shaping the nutraceutical landscape. So Vic, it's so great to have you today. And Bethany, think, it's great to be here. Yes, yes. And first, I think it'd be great if you could just walk us through your journey into the Australian wild food industry and the inception of Australian functional ingredients. Sure. Well, we're going back many, 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 many decades. Uh, I was foraging as a teenager. I'd go out to national parks uh, around Sydney and uh, further interstate and uh, around the place and just just taste things and I sort of do all this sort of taste and spit type uh, concept. I didn't even know what I was eating, but uh, at the time, I think there was only one guidebook, which was Wild Foods in Australia, um, published in the 70s, and and one report that the uh, military had as a, as a bit of a foraging guide, mainly in the, in the very top of Australia. Um, so not very useful, um, both of those. Uh, so sort of discovering for myself. And I actually did a, a science degree and in, in, in initially into oceanography because I was into dome, you know, snorkeling and scuba diving and so forth as well. So I thought, nah, maybe we'll all do oceanography, but then decided, nah, I'd better find out what I've been eating all these years. What's their botany? What's the, you know, the nature of the plants and so on? So I did a, a triple degree, which was um, biochemistry, um, industrial micro which sort of interested me in part as well and I commercialized that later on in in my career but also environmental biology I was absolutely just blown away by the environment and uh, uh, the botany of uh, of it and I was really lucky in the early days um, while I was still doing my degree which was sort of because it was uh, there were so many subjects and effectively three degrees um, it was over five, a five-year period and uh, my lecturer, who was actually Nicole Kidman, you might have heard of the Australian mm-hmm. actress, well, her father, Tony Kidman, was my biochemistry lecturer, stopped me in the hallway um, uh, mid my <laughs> my degrees, and he said, are you still here? I've got a job for you. And he found me this job in clinical pharmacology at one of the universities, um, been teaching at um, one of the hospitals here in Sydney. And clinical pharmacology was all about basically neuroscience and drug and uh, uh, our re- reaction to those. I was working on schizophrenia, Parkinsonism, Huntington's career. Um, in fact, um, Marjorie Guthrie, who was married to Woody Guthrie, American folk singer, son- and um, had Arlo Guthrie, who was you know, a, a hero of mine in the musical uh, uh, industry with um uh, Alice's restaurant was a big hit of his day, uh, way, way back. I'm showing my age here. Uh, <laughs> but she funded the research for a few years, even in clinical pharmacology. And in, it's interesting that the neuroscience also is now again at the forefront of uh, so many health concerns with mental diseases and uh, um, uh, ADHD and so forth. Schizophrenia, obviously, um, uh, Alzheimer's. So all that sort of um, stuff was almost laid a ground, uh, the groundwork for what I was going to do later. Then I was really lucky in that out of nearly 100 applicants, I got a job in nutritional science um, at the University of Sydney, and that was analysing wild foods for their protein, fat, carbohydrate, vitamins, minerals, all that sort of stuff. And it was still in the early days before we get into the the phytonutrients, the antioxidants, anti-inflammatories, adaptogens, and uh, the whole many, many, there's about nine different classes of phytonutrients now that um, uh, are really the leading edge of medicine again and and health. So um, that's my background. Uh, And through all that, while I was actually, uh, in fact, even in my first year of analysing the wild foods, I would get large samples of foods because they had to be a representative sample. So you you might get a half a bucket full of a particular food, freeze dry it, pulverize it to a powder, and then you analyze literally only a handful, sometimes only a you know half a teaspoon of uh, uh, a product. You don't need it for uh, for too many analyses. Um, and um, I was totally fortunate again, even though I was storing all these. Um, 
uh, these powders that I would taste the foods and I'd sort of get a bit of uh, a feel for them before I rendered them into a, a freeze dried powder. And I was just blown away by the flavors. There's just new flavors. You think you've tried every citrus fruit in the world, and then suddenly, you know, the lemon aspen has got this almost a grapefruit pash, um, sort of. It's sort of lemony and, and mandarinish, I guess, in a way, but it's a brand new citrus. And so that's exciting to me and was exciting. And so many flavors that had these aromatic and pungents and then herbs and spices came into it. So I actually approached a restaurant that was promoting themselves as an Australian restaurant and said, Well, what do you serve? You know, what's Australian? He says, Oh, well, we do uh, we do buffalo. I said, hang on, that's not that's Asian, you know, that's not an Australian species. Oh, and kangaroo at the time was actually illegal to serve in Australia. And um uh, unless it was the only meat on the restaurant. So we had to tackle those sorts of legal issues as well. I got kangaroo on the menu, I got a whole lot of seafood associated with all these. Um, plant and herb uh, product. So that was sort of how I started. And then it just grew from there. And while I was doing the nutritional work, I also traveled around Australia, crisscrossed the country many, many times, um, worked um, again. Funding has always been a challenge. And I mean, you know, going to Marjorie uh, Guthrie was one thing. And um, well, in fact, she coming to the to the department and then funding the, uh, the research was just brilliant. Um, but I got funding from Qantas to fund my trips around the world and or around the country, sorry, not the world, um, getting samples in from around the, the country as well, working with the health department up in the top end uh, in one of the north, area called the Northern Territory, uh, the Royal Flying Doctor Service in remote areas. Uh, they helped me move into uh, parts of Northern Queensland again, I visited three or four Aboriginal communities up there. And I, I used to go back time and time again. So it was very, very fortunate. I then bought a four-wheel drive and then also went out for, uh, for weeks at a time, was involved in many, many research projects and so on. And I guess... Um, it was a bit of early groundwork for how I started working and, and developed the entrepreneurial uh, race as well, because it was easier for me to maintain relationships with people that I'd met and I'd visited and lived with and gone out with bush with them and foraged. And then they would send product in for analysis to the lab. And in many ways, I found that by maintaining all those sorts of relationships, and having friends, in fact, you know, here in uh, in the Indigenous world, it's sort of aunties. So I've got aunties all over the country um, who would welcome me every time I go uh, and appeared in those communities. And even now I can ring up and get to the, get to the people. And then, um, uh, you know, we talk about old days and, and we're out bush again. Unfortunately, many of them do pass. I seem to be outliving everyone out uh, that I that I went out with um, in the early days, the older women. And um but still, it is very, very interesting that um, I've done the same thing with the business uh, because like a lot of businesses, you bring on partners and you think that they're going to contribute to the business and they bring a little bit of money in and they value their money more than my decades of, uh, uh, of experience and research and, and connections. And I've been through all the legal hassles that a lot of early entrepreneurs have, um, uh, have suffered as well. Um, but um, you learn to maintain the relationships really tightly. And so, you know, I effectively, I can get away from those partners legally or otherwise. It might cost some money, but at least the business stays mine. Um, and then I just started new businesses. I wound up a few um, a, a few business entities, but I never left any debt behind. Uh, and again, so my suppliers and my customers stayed with me through several iterations of the business. So effectively, I've been in business since the early 1980s um, and uh, was the pioneer of the wild food industry at that stage, worked with governments to try and introduce the uh, um, the whole concept to industry and worked with a few of the growers who were sort of starting to emerge. And uh, we had an Australian association of um, Indigenous uh, foods um, and there's been, again, movement through there. A lot of people have gone broke, particularly through the GFC and then COVID and so forth. Um, and so, yeah, that's some um, sort of it in a way. But um, hopefully this internet connection being unstable, we're back again. Um, hopefully, um, in, in many ways, uh, I, I guess the educational side of things has been the most challenging. 
um, how to train chefs uh, to use the products. Uh, I always thought, here's a whole, think of an artist that's discovering a whole new set of colours. An artist, you would think a painter would be extremely excited about using these colours and they just adapt them to what they're doing in their um, in their day to day. So I thought chefs would be sort of the same, you know, their colours are the foods and the flavours that they use. And so um, I very quickly discovered that although I thought I'd been overnight success in a couple of years, uh, it's taken 25 years, uh, well, more now, in fact, probably close to 30, 35, where chefs finally are wanting to use these flavours and I've been able to provide some networks, some structure, some empirical data, if you like, um, from a scientific viewpoint, um, uh, that um, allows chefs to then taste a product and then incorporate into any cuisine. Uh, because typically chefs are taught, you know, an Italian style, a French style, a German, American, whatever, and they follow those and then they muck around the edges and we have fusion cuisine or confusion cuisine. <laughs> but you bring a new a whole class of ingredients and without an established cuisine, because don't forget there were 600 different clans around Australia and they all had a, a smattering of nearly 3,000 different foods in, in, in this continent. Um, and so there wasn't any clear definition and it didn't take long for the British to absolutely decimate the Austra the, uh, the Indigenous Australians uh, as a population and, and fragment the, the, the whole First Nation people. Now they're starting to come together. There's a lot of Indigenous chefs, which is great to see, um, men and women, um, and I work with many of them. Um, but... Still, I'm still struggling to um, teach chefs that there's more than just five flavours, um, and it's even an, an effort to pull those flavours from chefs um, when, when you know, you're sort of asking, well, you know your foods, you know food and flavour, what are the flavours in food? There's 12 of them, there's actually 13, or but what are the flavours in food? And flavours and, and smells and so forth, and they get stuck on herbs and, and spices. Well, you know, there's pungency and, herb, and aromatics, if you like, herbaceous notes aromatics, pungence. So, you know, by being able to provide some language of communication, and I, in a way, had to become a chef by jargon, a chef by training. I had to show people how the foods went together. I ran countless courses for chefs. Um, then I even funded a 13-part TV series called Dining Down Under, and uh, dining-downunder.com is still out there as a website, and that's way back from 2003, I think we did it, to five. And I travelled uh, that TV show, which I funded myself, 13-part series, um, with myself and two other chefs. Uh, well, two chefs. I'm, wasn't, I'm not really a qualified chef. I just cook with the ingredients um, and tell chefs that they should be cooking this way. But it's um, uh, arrogance, I guess. Uh, but in any event, I uh, had fun doing that. Uh, it showed in 48 countries and some uh, sometimes uh, twice in those countries. And so I took one of the chefs that did the show with me and uh, we just travelled the world for a number of years doing Australian food promotions, um, lived in some uh, or spent, you know, a couple of weeks in some amazing places uh, on the planet, uh, a few American uh, places as well, smaller restaurants p uh, primarily, but uh, went to Moscow, went to Nagoya, Osaka in Japan, Guam, um, New Zealand. Uh, we did work on airlines, on cruise ships, um, sailed some six-star cruise ships, which was awesome for, in fact, three times. Um, so, you know, that was the way that I, in a way, presented the flavour to the chefs I met and got as much publicity as I can with it. Um, and then let it go and, and you try and then survive things like the GFC and, and COVID and so forth with restaurants closing and businesses going. So I guess my, um, again, in a way, I borrowed from Aboriginal culture, from Indigenous Australian culture, where they always had alternative resources. And um, even with medicines, for example, if you got a headache or if you cut yourself badly, you needed to be able to treat that condition irrespective of where you are walking around in, or living at the time in, in your country. Um, and so my business ended up with a retail range, a food service range, um, a um, now these days a health range, and that's sort of my passion in a way. I've cycled back 
all the way from you know clinical pharmacology through nutritional science into the food industry and now back into um, into the health concepts of food as well. And um, uh, okay, the PR is always sort of out there trying to um, you know try and pay as much attention as you can, write articles these days online with blogs and medium and so forth. Uh, various um, uh, various ways of just getting information out there. Uh, email database uh, driving is probably the biggest uh, driver for my uh, for my business these days. But um, you know the whole concept has always been to have as many strings to your bow. Um, and one of those, in fact, was almost a side shoot, which was uh, herbal active. We say herbal; it's herbal active for <laughs> Americans. Um, uh, but herbal active is a, a natural antimicrobial. And uh, it, in a way, epitomised, and it, it won a, a, um, a Australian Food Industry Innovation Award back in 2013. Um, and I've just signed a deal for to one company in Australia and another in the US um, to potentially distribute the product to extend the shelf life of, her, of fresh produce uh, and meats uh, as well, proteins as well. Um, but it becomes, it's sort of like a fruit and veggie wash, but it's better than that. It um, also improves food safety. It also uh, reduces food waste, obviously, so there's environmental concerns as well, or benefits as well, plus uh, extending the food um, uh, shelf life and therefore saving you money at the end of the day. Um, but that's just one tiny little facet. And it's a bit like wild foods across the board. You know, they fit into one market and then suddenly there's another market, another market, another market. So we've also supplied manufacturers with freeze-dried or dried products. And um, uh, that's always been ongoing because it's bigger slabs of, of purchases and bigger amounts of products. So, um, you know, the McCormick's of the market and um, and others. We've gotten onto, gotten onto airlines with Virgin Australia and Qantas and so on. Um, and that, again, is big slabs of, uh, of business at a time. But it comes and goes. So you have to remain as flexible as you are with events like GFC and COVID as well. Um, so, you know, you learn basically along the way. And um, I guess... Um, my passion now is the the health food range uh, and herbal active. They're the two strands to my business that I'm most keen on developing and sort of 10xing in a way, um, and they are growing rapidly now because the herbal active uh, we've just moved it into a, an oral, a professional dental healthcare um, oral program, um, great for pets as well, um, and. Um, uh, interesting that we spend more money on our pets than we do on ourselves. And so, you know, it's, it's a nice little opportunity in a way. Uh, and I can actually, um, uh, with uh, a pet poodle that I had years ago that ended up with sort of pretty late stage uh, periodontal disease and the vent said, look, you, you're going to have to remove all the dog's teeth. I said, well, how's it going to eat? Uh, and they said, soft food, and that's not going to work because it really liked punching liver treats and things like that. Um, so anyway, I started to, I had 12 months before this dog was going to go into surgery and, um, cost me two or $3,000 at the time and have all its teeth removed and then live a miserable life. Um, so I started spraying the teeth and gums with my herbal active. Three months later, we went back to the vet. Um, and, you know, sure enough, the vet looks in the mouth, looks on a computer for the earlier prognosis by another vet back to the dog's mouth, looked all over the place, back to the computer. I said, yeah, look, um, I've been spraying it with a product that I uh, that I make and market and paid no attention to that, totally ignored it, just basically said, oh, look, it must have been a misdiagnosis. You know, well, it was on you. The teeth were basically brown and the gum was infected at the time. Uh, but I healed it up totally. And, in fact, recently, just a couple of weeks ago, I ended up with a, a, um, a split tooth, um, had the dental, uh, the dentist cap the tooth and sort of clean it up a little bit. And then a few days later, I got this infection in the gum and the tooth went wobbly. I thought I was going to lose it. Again, herbal active in the mouth a week and it's um, back in there. It's solid, no pain, no infection whatsoever. So again, I'm back on the path of getting it into uh, oral care products even more widely rather than just the, um, the, the, the movement into the US with it. So uh, there's lots and lots of uh, these sorts of advantages. Um, 
It's exciting, I guess. Um, it's exciting because there's so many opportunities, uh, but then trying to regulate what's going to take the minimum amount. Can I find joint venture partners to do it? Um, the, the formulation for Herbal Active is not patented because anyone could change a recipe. It's it's food products mm -hmm. essentially mixed into a, into a format. Um, so it's proprietary knowledge. Um, there are so many ingredients that no one can easily analyse it and break it all down because it's a mix of nine different essential oils um, and um, done all the science on it and gone through the US FDA. So it's approved in America, it's approved um, internationally and we've sold it internationally. Um, and that business in the US now is starting to become quite significant. Um, so that's exciting as well. It's been sprayed on packaging for cold filling food products and so on. Um, and uh, I've got a couple of companies that are sort of starting to move it forward themselves. And we actually sell a concentrate into the US to cut the um, cost of moving stuff across the across the planet. Um, and uh, we then formulate a co uh, the concentrate into the finished products in the US, um, in, in Arizona, and then that goes out to our customers. So again, a series of um, relationships that I maintain that keeps the whole thing in-house and pretty tight as well. So no one can really copy it easily. Um, and the wild food products as health products is absolutely amazing. Uh, we can't make claims here in Australia anywhere near what can be made in Australia, in the US, and, and actually uh, people get away with things. Um, the FDA obviously has some guidelines, but they're a bit more flexible than the tight rules that we're um, uh, really handcuffed within um, in Australia where you cannot make any claims over food, but you can draw some food health relationships, which um, which is neat. Um, and a lot of the information now seems to be leaking out there from my pushing. And I've only got four products um, and a couple of um, you know oral mists and, and facial mists, which are functional as well. But my four products pretty much address most of the diseases of nutrition. Um, and so these are the food health relationships that I can sort of talk about um, and, and not making claims as such, but simply allude to the fact that these are phytonutrient rich products and phytonutrients have been academically shown to do this, this, this and this. So it's sort of an indirect claim. And um, I'm very proud that I've had oncologists refer their terminal patients to me. People have been told they're at the very end of their lives, end of the path, end of the road with conventional medicine. And I can imagine what the ecologists have said, you know, there's this crank in Sydney, he's blogging this stuff, check it out and see if it's going to work, you know, because you've got no other options, go get your life in order. And, um, uh, you know, there, there is no way forward now. And um, they've, they've come to me in desperation. We've been able to have um, women with breast cancer, um, several uh, types of um, uh, gastric cancer. Um, there's been a whole range across the board. And interestingly, the science now, looking just at a couple of the ingredients that, that are in my products as well, um, specifically, they've been able to essentially show that in test tubes, they're extremely potent against lines of cancers, and yet they're totally innocuous to normal human cells. So, that's exactly what you want. And now my products are proving to work in the same way. I don't like being um, sort of uh, responsible for people at the very end of their, their their treatment, obviously end of the road. I prefer to get people early on, get them into it, and then benefiting from all the work. The interesting thing is um, way back in 1908 and more in 19, uh, was it 1913, 1914, 1916, now more recently, there's been a, an explosion of work done through paleoethnopathology. So that's looking at um, ethnic remains from discrete groups and looking at soft tissues. And with the science and technology that we have now, we can actually look at these tissues, soft tissues, remains, and it's fairly rare, but they've been able to study um, uh, through path pathology, through pathological methods, that cancers were almost non-existent in cultures that were traditional or eating their traditional diets, pre-agricultural, so hunter-gatherers largely, around the world. And so in, in, in Australia, in America, with the um, 
uh, Native Americans, with the um, uh, in Africa, with a whole range of different tribes, and even in parts of Europe, where foraging for foods and eating these amazing wild foods from around the world was so protective against, as I say, the disease of nutrition, cancer, diabetes, uh, hypertension, mental diseases now. Um, and, and we're learning more and more as to how those food and the quality of those foods is actually causing and delivering those results. So that's exciting times for me that, you know, on a new pathway in a way, I mean, I've been at it for 10 years on the health aspects, coming back, as I said, to nutrition and being able to put these things into play and have people ring up and say, yeah, look, I was on the road to a heart attack and now my arteries are clean, my heart's no longer calcified and atrial fibrillation's gone, it's now normal. The doctor said that was impossible. And um, and in a way, I'm, I'm, I am challenging, again, the establishment. Before it was the culinary establishment, um, they say there's you know, new ideas are easy, but changing old ideas is the hard part. Um, and with, with medicine, again, we're going holistic, we're going whole food, we're using food as medicine, and we are nailing so many of these diseases of nutrition that um, I think the next five, 10 years is going to be extremely exciting. Um, so, and we're also sort of dropping back to looking at the causative associations or the, the actual causes of many diseases and the progression of disease. One of my um, good friends uh, ha developed MS um, and uh, she, um, uh, she was getting quite a... Um, getting to the stage where she was unable to move her feet. And so she was going to physio and sort of sitting in a chair and the physiotherapist was saying, well, now think, you know, move your left foot, move your right foot, and sort of trying to, trying to engage the, the mental connection between brain and feet. And she wasn't able to move her feet with this exercise. So I got her onto my all four of my products, developed a protocol for her, and um, I got this phone call and here Simone was... Um, over the moon, basically saying, I've moved them four times. I've moved my left foot. It's never happened before. I don't know whether it's your product or whatever, but all I'm doing you know, amongst all the other things I take, I started your product and now I can move my foot. And, um, yeah, a few weeks later, she rang up again. All she said was 14. I said, and we had a long talk after there. So we know that it can undo a lot of damage that has previously been conceived as permanent damage and irreparable. So... Um, that, in a way, is my lifestyle. Um, that's the reward from being an entrepreneur, that, you know, you can actually make a difference in, in, in the world, in people's planet, uh, people's um, own world and on for the planet as well. And I guess even with climate change, by encouraging farmers to safeguard uh, remnant bushland because there may be wild foods in there, enrich bushland with productive wild foods, that's also been a whole part of it because I'm having to uh, address my main concern, which is will I have enough raw ingredients um, to supply the demand as it comes on as I 10x my business? Um, so that's what I'm doing along the way is making sure that the um, the ingredients are there, the supply is underpinned, they are still wild quality and we're not taking the wild foods down the same road as with conventional foods where as soon as we began to agriculture food 10,000 years ago, we reduced the nut, the range of foods that we ate from, well, Aborigines uh, all around the country, Indigenous Australians, I'm using the old word, Indigenous Australians are, um, uh, had access to 10 times the number of foods that we eat today but when you look at the nutritional value, it was in infinitely better than what we're eating today. Um, you look at fruits, for example, there's only the avocado that has fat as a as a fat soluble vitamin uh, source. Um, every other fruit that we eat that's cultivated has lost the fat soluble phytonutrients. Uh, they've just been bred out and fallen by the wayside as agronomists are growing fruits and vegetables more for the distribution line and export than for our inherent nutrition. Um, and uh, as you breed tomatoes that become more robust, the flavour disappears because it's in the same area on the DNA. So genetically, you might be looking for one variant, one characteristic, but you're always compromising nutrition along the way. Sugars are also a problem. You know, we can 
Um, you think, you know, oh, the uh, information in Australia is two fruits and five vegetables. Well, that says a lot that vegetables are better than fruits. But you work around with Indigenous Australians and they ate far more fruits and varied fruits than they did vegetables. Now, they might have had half a dozen vegetables, but they had dozens of fruits that they ate in a year. And um, those fruits were low sugar, were high fibre, were massively rich in in, uh, in antioxidants, anti-inflammatories, in adaptogens, uh, minerals that we're, we're also losing through impoverished soils and so forth. And everything's balanced uh, in a way we as human beings evolved with that style of food, with wild foods. It bugs me that, you, you know, we talk about Mediterranean diet. Well, Mediterranean diet wasn't what Jamie Oliver in the US, uh, in the UK basically says is the Mediterranean diet, which is, you know, olive oil and uh, sardines and uh, you know, a couple of other fish um, and seafood octopus and so forth and and very little else. And then you get chilies from uh, South America. And, and I mean, that's the crazy Mediterranean diet. But the interesting thing is that around the shores of the Mediterranean, Different countries had up to 100, 200, 300 different wild foods that were the basis of the Roman Empire's food. Um, that is what the you know the old Mediterranean diet, the true Mediterranean diet that does support good health, that does allow long um, life and healthy lives and an acute brain the whole way, um, good cognitive health along the way, which I think is really, really important. What's the point of living in a an old people's home when you're um, uh, essentially in, in adult nappies and just getting your bottom washed once or twice a day? That's no life for me. And, and eating rubbish food because they're cutting corners on the uh, on the budget as well for the um, old people's home. <laughs> You've got to basically look at how do you want to live? What's the point of living past a particular year, past a particular age? If your cognition's good, if your health's there, if you can basically stop things like muscle wastage and bone density changes, and you're actually as fit as you are, now, it's true that you know 70, which is on there next year, um, 70 is really the new 30 if you do it right. Um, and so, you know, I'm planning my projects for the year 100 to uh, 110 years of age. So that's where it goes. This episode is brought to you by NutraPayments.com. If your business needs credit card processing that fully integrates with most major Nutra software platforms, offers the lowest industry prices, and has built-in features like recurring billing, $0 trials, and chargeback prevention, then visit us at NutraPayments.com for a free online quote. Yes. Well, and I think it's exciting that, you know, the concept you've been talking about that food is medicine is really gaining traction. So mm. how do some of your products like life contribute to this movement? Yeah. Uh, and I guess um, with the uh, conventional industry, they're sort of saying, we'll take supplements with the foods. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the only path that they can go. And I, I suppose, uh, don't agree with supplements. Um, there's very few supplements that are worth actually taking in synthetic forms. Um, B12 would be one of them. But um, most of the others, I mean, you take a multivitamin tablet with B vitamins and whatever, um, it takes seconds to be peeing iridescent yellow, which means that your body has recognised that chemical concoction is just toxic and waste and is stripped through your body, taken out of your digestive system, taken out of the blood, through the liver, kidney, and you're basically excreting it in seconds. So it's money down the toilet. Um, as far as I'm concerned. So my concept is one of augmented nutrition. And that's where wild foods come in. You can have, you can eat what you want to eat because of the, um, it is what we have in, in bulk and that's what we're used to. And we can still buy conventional foods that are now impoverished nutritionally. Uh, and often you have to moderate it by not eating too many sweet foods. I mean, interesting, our mango, can have 3% more Coke, more sugar than a can of Coke or Pepsi, okay? Now, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. One mango, by weight, you know, maybe if, uh, just work at equal amounts of weight to weight. Mango to soft drink can have 3% more sugars, bad sugars, in the mango. Same with things like pineapple and um, 
uh, papaya or pawpaw. There are so many fruits are bred for their sweetness. I think in the US there's now tomatoes or tomatoes that um, can have ridiculous amounts of sugar. I mean, what's the point? You know, corn is another classic sweet corn. Candy corn now, in in uh, again, developed in the US just for its sugar content. Now, all we're doing there is poisoning ourselves. I, I coined the term bad sugars. I don't think anyone else has really taken it up yet. But like bad fats and good fats, bad sugars, there's only two bad sugars, and that's sucrose because it is half fructose and half glucose and fructose on its own. But so anything that's high in fructose or sucrose becomes a source of bad sugar. So agave nectar is really concentrated fructose. So it's no, not not recommended as a sweetener at all. It's super sweet. And the fructose now is the causative agent where kids are now getting gout, whereas before it was only for, you know, rich old men that overindulged in wine and, and, and too much meat. Uh, now it's literally women and kids are getting gout the same as, you know, more and more men as well. So we need to look at what we're eating in those sorts of, in the conventional foods. But if you can then simply augment your nutrition with wild foods, and that's where my products come into it as well, um, the, either the health products or the component ingredients, but it's easier in the health. I mean, my product that I call LIFE, which stands for lifelized, means freeze-dried, lifelized indigenous food essentials. And it took me a while to come up with that, but <laughs> it works. Um, it tells you exactly what it is. They are essential for life. They're, they're freeze-dried and they're indigenous to Australia. And they're food, so it says it all. But LIFE um, is a blend of 14 Australian wild foods uh, several near wild foods that are produced in Australia, but uh, down in Tasmania, in our southern state, we still have a hole in the ozone layer. And the farmers growing black currants measured the antioxidant capacity of their black currants and compared it to black currants growing anywhere else in the world. And because of the ozone layer, the plants are responding to that environmental toxic effect essentially by forming more antioxidants and so what we use is not the juice of the red currant but just the squashed remains when the juice is is pressed we take the skins the seeds um and uh, effectively the, the the mark of the red currant and that's what we freeze dry and put into life so it's a near wild plant because it's now responding to its environmental um, growing characteristics and uh, giving you a much more near wild quality food um, so that's what we do. We do also uh, add wild blueberries from Canada uh, that go into our product and we freeze dry those. Um, and uh, acacia gum is a component as well, both of the herbal active and we add some into life as well because it's a brilliant fibre and it's wild crafted in Africa. So there's three wild or near wild foods from other um, other countries. And then we pick a couple of other ingredients that are just there for um, for other elements that can complement what's in wild food as well um so that's a it's a nice way of then being able to give i think there's 27 ingredients all up in life to nutritionally augment whatever you eat and so taking life once or twice a day allows us to overcome fatigue um that feeling of just being down and like you're sort of working through molasses basically as uh, as the days get heavy but it really it tackles our stressful lifestyle it also helps detoxify because we are living in a more toxic environment with all the chemicals around us and um and day-to-day -day stress obviously is, is still there and over time the interesting thing is as you improve your diet with these phytonutrients, you change the population of and or, and, and numbers of gut bugs. So you know the the um, tens of millions of organisms in our gut uh, essentially dictate what we eat. And if you get good bacteria growing in your gut, they then tell your brain, "I want more of that." The same way as if you eat you know McDonald's or you know whatever food is nutritionally deplete, and you live on those sorts of foods you get a population of microorganisms in your gut that tells your body and your brain, I want more McDonald's, and that's why it's so popular. It's interesting also that the we're driven by taste drives, um, and um, I do write a lot about it in one of my books, uh, Wild Foods uh, is the title. 
Um, and, and the subtitle is Looking Back 60,000 Years for Clues to Our Future Survival. And that's what I'm all about these days. Um, but um, it is interesting that taste drives for fat and sugar primarily, but also for Maillard products. Um, and they're a group of, of products that we find in cooked meat, where the meat uh, on a barbecue particularly, in the browning on meat, that forms Maillard products. Uh, they are Maillard products, baked products, uh, sometimes fermented products. You get Maillards in things like um, chocolate, coffee, um, roasted, toasted notes, baked foods and so forth. We have a taste drive for those as well because cooked food releases more of the nutrients than raw food. Um, that's why we like cooked food so much. So with those three taste drives, if you go in the wild for something sweet, you're typically getting low sugar um, fruits anyway, or food, um, sometimes it's tree exudates, things like sap that's sweet or wild honey uh, from either bees or ants in Australia. Um, but by going for those sweet foods and, and responding to your gut's drive and driving your brain for sweetness, you're also getting fibre, you're getting exercise. And even the wild honeys now, and not just, um, you go back and look at wild honeys, rather than just a sugar syrup, they're loaded with individual amino acids, which are the building blocks of protein. They're filled with waxes and other phytonutrients that are extremely potent. Um, and I, uh, I did discover uh, just how potent. I spent three days one time living with a, a family, an Indigenous Australian family in Central Australia, um, and I didn't take any food uh, with me because I, you know, basically rely on finding something to eat. Um, and often, you since you're going out with uh, with the women, you're almost invariably going to get something to eat. But we actually only found wild honey, and I was chopping these hives open, and we found five hives all up. Uh, and so we fed ourselves. It was myself and a, and a friend at the time, um, a family of um, there was three women and a whole bunch of kids, and we all lived off this wild honey for three days. And when I woke up even the first day, I slept really soundly at night, coloured, very colourful dreams, I recall. But when I woke up, everything was crystal clear. I could see for ages. The sound that I could hear was all crackly and sharp. I was full of energy. And for three days, I literally was living on a high as if I'd been on the, I don't know, the very best narcotic drugs you can find. Um, but uh, really strong uppers. It was incredible. And, and um, you can replace and, and re, re, re uh, experience that any, many times uh, repeating, uh, but with just living on wild honey for a short while. It is rare. We're now starting to breed hives and there's, uh, there's people with hundreds of hives uh, but typically they're selling the honey and leaving the pollen for the bees and so forth. But there's another industry just in those and um, the Australian native bees, an interesting little stingless critter. Um, so, you know, there's an offshoot business there. So in many ways, I've created an industry. Um, I've got chefs using the product. I have Indigenous opportunities growing as well. Um, I've found niches and markets for a lot of different people. I've been fairly generous with the information. I haven't patented things like wattle seed, which I invented way back as a food flavour. And one particular wattle seed roasted in just the right way and milled in the right way will give you a flavour that's almost coffee, chocolate and hazelnut when you extract the flavour. So it's brilliant in chocolate and white chocolate. It's great in ice cream and cream and so on. Um, and we made the best waddle chino on the planet from that as well. So, but, you know, I've not patented that. I've not restricted it. I just want to leave it out there and let everyone benefit. And then finally, the industry now, we see that it's a little bit on a on a roller coaster and steam uh, a steamroller just moving through the food industry, through the health industry and so on. So I guess that's been my mo main motivation for doing what I do. Um, and I must admit, I love being an entrepreneur. Yes, yes. And I think with this industry that you've created, there's probably a lot of challenges and opportunities. So how do you foresee promoting Australian wild foods on more of a global scale? Um, 
I guess I'm learning from where I was before. Um, way, just pre-GFC, I did actually license a range of recipes um, to a company that then marketed in America. And we had um, 1,600 outlets in America. We had all the Whole Foods markets, the Trader Joe's. We had, um, um, at the time, Wild Oats as well um, before um, um, Whole Foods bought them. Um, we had a lot of private or smaller supermarket chains uh, in Florida and in Texas and so forth, and it got great distribution. Uh, what the my partners who basically licensed my recipes um, had uh, had done is that they worked on the distribution, but they didn't spend a lot of time or money educating the the customers. They were hoping that that would happen in store with in store demonstrations and this sort of stuff. The GFC hit, there was no one in the stores and these guys, unfortunately, just through bad timing, went belly up. Interestingly, I still, and this was what, 2007, I still get Americans emailing me saying, we can't <laughs> find the source that we really liked of yours and we're looking to uh, give it away as a gift and use it ourselves. Where is it available? Oh, I'm sorry, it's not anymore. It's gone. Um, so there's an opportunity there to resurrect it. Uh, but we are putting our toes back in the water. I've just got another deal with um, a, a customer of mine who's been using my health products and introduced his mother, who was actually a, an MD, and she was a bit of a chore to get um, uh, on board. But after a whole heap of scientific papers, she saw the light and uh, is now on the products as well for her health. Um, but he's come to me and said he wants to represent us in the US and, and he's got the the um, structure and the uh, ability to do it and the history with his other products. So we're looking at putting at starting that up um, in the US again. And that literally is um, we're just about waiting for the packaging. We'll be packing here um, with his labels and his his uh, designs and everything on the on, on the on the product. Uh, we're packing and we'll have at least two uh, and then possibly four of the ingredients by the end of the year uh, with the launch, I think, happening in June. So that's all exciting. Uh, we're gearing up to that. And the numbers are big. The numbers are great. I'm looking at managing that well. Uh, the Herbal Active, as I say, is already taking off through another avenue in the US and also in the UK and Australia. Um, so in a way, I've narrowed my focus. Um, I have fewer things to think about. I work from home, which is terrific. I've got a factory here in Sydney uh, with the staff who look after it. Um, and so I'm working hard now, working on the business, not in it and uh, looking at really following the passion where I, uh, where I, where where it takes me, but being very, very specific i'm saying no to more customers people i mean one of the big trends is um uh, vodka gin and most of the spirits distillers wanting to use native um, flavors and native botanicals um i've not yet met a, distrib a, a distiller who knows how to take some of these flavors appropriately out and having tasted the whole range of what's out there there is no gin or vodka that delivers the flavours that I would want to taste of the native flavours. They might be in there and I know I'm selling them some product, uh, but I'm saying no to more distillers than I'm saying yes to because um, the easiest way to get the flavours is to actually post blend flavours into a finished product, um, not rely on the distillation process to uh, be able to handle a product like lemon myrtle, for example, where the aromatics evaporate at 40 degrees C um, and think that that's going to work with your distillation when you also have to pull out, you know, the flavours of juniper, for example, in a gin, which is a much lower temperature, uh, much higher temperature range. It, it, it's a fairly resistant um, aromatic to come out of the um, out of the gin, out of the juniper berries. So, you know, you can't easily... Uh, put a, um, a whole mix of, of herbs and fruits and other things and get a decent flavour at the end of the day. You may as well have a lemon myrtle flavoured or a wild, say, a rainforest infused gin and then put the flavours in, um, in their appropriate extract forms. Um, and we can do that very easily with um, uh, very simple preparations. Um, so, you know, there's all sorts of challenges there, but I'm ignoring things that are simple steps to get to an, um, 
uh, to, to a finished product, but would take my time and not be anywhere near as big or as impactful or as significant or as rewarding for me personally as my health food range and my herbal active. So I'm focusing on just those two paths, um, narrowing down my scattergun approach that I had in the past where I had to do everything to just survive in the in the tough years. Um, and um, now it's more a, a business. Uh, I've been lucky as well being able to crowdfund certain elements of the business. The life product itself was crowdfunded, and one of my major contributors was an Indigenous Australian fellow that just loved what I do, and um, he, uh, he, he funded a lot of the early work on that in the formulation. So um, it's great. It's a nice environment to be working with to, uh, in, in this day and age. Yes, absolutely. Well, once again, a big thank you to Vic Cherikoff for offering a fascinating glimpse into the power and potential of Australian wild foods and the food industry and beyond that. Um, his work not only pays homage to ancient traditions, but also paves the way for future innovations in health, cuisine, and sustainable practices. To learn more about Vic's work and Australian functional ingredients, check out the links provided in our episode description. Thank you for joining us on this journey through the vibrant world of nutraceuticals. Don't forget to subscribe and share your thoughts on today's episode on social media. Stay tuned for more insightful discussions here on Nutrapreneur.